Hello, everybody, and thank you for tuning in to the Liberty Report. With me today is Daniel McAdams. Daniel, good to see you. Good morning, Dr. Paul. Guess what? We're still talking about Brexit. <laughs> <laughs> and the whole country is, the whole world is still yeah. talking about Brexit because it is a, um, a big issue. And uh, we'll try to sort some of this out uh, on this. I imagine you've been uh, watching the news. Uh, any comments that you'd like to make? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think it's, 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 a, it's, a, it's an earthquake in the political world. It's a, it's the, the magnitude is, is enormous. However, the changes that people might expect to see overnight, they may not see overnight, and that may produce, that may be a, a, a produce some results that are unexpected. Yeah, and you know, the, the whole thing is, is there's going to be a lot of blame game going on here now. There, there's going to be chaos in the markets and political chaos and, and civil chaos. It'll all be because of Brexit and, and that particular vote. But that's sort of like, I think, missing the point. Uh, a lot of times when there's a stock market bubble, uh, nobody says that, and then there's a crash. They want to say, who caused the crash? Who were the bad guys? Somebody caused the crash. But it was something that preceded it. They guaranteed there would be a crash, whether it's in the stock market or in the economy. When something is unstable, it comes apart. It comes apart for different reasons. And I think the European Union was always unstable. It didn't make sense from the very beginning. And yet they've patched it together. They, you know, conned people into believing about it for political and economic reasons. And uh, there were some things that on the surface looked better for the people because there are some good arguments for having uh, easier travel and easier trade, even though it was a much bigger deal than just you know, opening up trade and communications. Uh, it, it was a movement toward a new world order, big government, uh, globalism. And when that's developed in the free market and it's voluntary, it's fine and dandy. But when it's used by force and pushing people into it and the people don't have much say, like they didn't have any say in Brussels writing laws against the British people, you know, it's, it's very unstable. And, uh, and then it invites people to come in and look for power and control so the financial people get control, whether it's the banks or corporations or the special political interests, and then you end up with some of the uh, military interests involved. But when that happens, you know, I think it's destined to fall apart. And that's the way I've looked at generally our economy, not only organizations like uh, the European Union, but uh, the, the, world, the world economy is patched together with dollar, uh, dollar hegemony, the paper dollar, the fiat system. And it, yes, it can work for a while, but, and it can be patched over for a long time, but eventually it's very unstable. So this is part of the instability that exists in the financial and economic markets. And I believe that, that uh, this, this dramatic uh, result here uh, isn't, uh, isn't a, uh, an explanation done by just saying, well, Brexit did it. If they didn't have the vote, it would all be okay. No, it was going to happen uh, anyway. And now I think it's up to us to sort out What's going to happen? What's the law say? When is this going to come about? It and uh, we've talked about it. We know that you know the referendum was not binding. They have a lot of things to do. Yeah. It could go on on for years. But the other side of it, what is the political message? You know, it is said, and to a degree, I believe this, that the government that a people have is a reflection of the people's will. Even the bad governments, they're tolerated for a while and they mm -hmm. put up with them. And uh, right now, I think the message is loud and clear, regardless of whether they roadblock and they don't go through with this and it takes five or ten years to uh, settle all the, uh, all the agreements. I mean, it proves they shouldn't have made so many agreements. <laughs> so this stuff should be voluntary. That, uh, but I think, I think there's something very much locked in place that it wasn't going to work, it's not going to work. The big question is, is what does it lead to? How much, how much violence and how much uh, economic chaos? And when will they realize that big government isn't the answer to these problems? Yeah. You can almost tr uh, trace the inevitable beginning of the end back to say 92 in the Maastricht Treaty, where you had, before you had a customs union of sovereign states, now starting to move into becoming a political union with a unified government that govern happen, government happened to be a non-elected government, or certainly not directly uh, elected by the people. As you tightened and deepened this political uh, integration, you, you know you left the people behind, and you saw so many times there were votes 
uh, in EU countries, and the people voted the wrong way, and so they redid it, and they kept redoing it. Ireland was one was one example. They would keep redoing it until they got the right response, and I think that um, that irritated people, and it has caused more people to go to the side of looking for going back to some national sovereignty and away from the centralized government. Yeah, I think the sovereignty issue is a, is the big issue. Uh, because I don't think the British are libertarians and they want to get rid of the EU because they're too much interventionist. But they resented the fact that these unelected officials were writing laws and rules, and then they have a court system. And if the court rules are right, there's no appeal. <laughs> and it's an un unelected court, and, and they're obligated to live under these laws. Just like we're having a grower obligation to live under UN resolutions. We go to war with UN resolutions and NATO. And I, I, I don't think the people have uh, awakened in this country either to how much sovereignty that we have lost. Uh, when, when the year EU was being put together, I, it made no sense to me. I said, you know, it's good to have voluntary, uh, you know, assimilation and get together and trade and have a sound currency. But this whole thing of assuming, especially an unelected group of special interest politicians getting together and saying that what we're going to do is we're going to make sure uh, that uh, we have policies that will satisfy the Spanish, the Italians, the, the Greeks, the British, the French, and the Germans. Mm -hmm. You know, history's... History tells us that there's a little bit of, uh, of nationalism that exists, and you just can't wipe that away. And I, I think in a libertarian society, there's no reason. Culturally, it, this is all permissible. You know, if, if all the associations, economic and social, are voluntary, you can still have your cultural independence. But in a way, this is coming to a climax because of our policies, and the British especially, because they work with us, we've been involved in the Middle East, we export uh, central banking and IRS taxation, mm -hmm. and we ex export Keynesian economics, at the same time we export war. We go over there and disrupt countries, so we have a lot of responsibility for the migration that has occurred, and then, then the people are required to pay for it. You know, uh, it's a burden. You know, in a, in a libertarian society, people can come and go, but they're on their own. They, they, don't, they don't get forced to pay for it. So if people come in in this country, you get good benefits. That means you and I get have to pay the taxes to take care of these people who get in front of the line and come in for political reasons and, and who knows what. That is, that is a setting just for mischief. And then when you think about a fragile economic system and a fragile social system, it's bound to break apart, and that is what we're seeing. So I think uh, the, the de facto business is much more important than the de jure. The de jure, you know, the, the, the law, when things like this uh, come about, it, uh, it doesn't matter. I, I think the Fed is going to end. But I don't expect Congress to all of a sudden someday, uh, you know, start listening to us and say, oh, yeah, well, let's pass this law and repeal the Federal Reserve Act. That's not going to happen. But it can end because it's not viable. And no matter what they do with their plunge protection team and all this secret stuff and QEs, it, it can't work. The question is, is how does it come apart? When does it come apart? And who's going to suffer the most? Yeah, and I, I was on uh, radio the day after the vote, and I, and I said that this reminds me of 1989. This is a 1989 for this generation. And if you think back of 1989 and the end of communism, it started in such a very simple way. It was simply East German uh, holidaymakers in, in, in Hungary on Lake Balaton who decided not to leave and were allowed to go through the Austrian border as they had not been allowed to do in the <laughs> first place. It was such a small, insignificant looking thing, but it started a tidal wave uh, that ended up in the fall of the Berlin Wall. And I think one of the things you're seeing in the, in the UK, you see Boris Johnson took a big risk and came out inside, uh, on the side of leaving, and now he looks to be the ascendant uh, potential prime minister. Uh, he's pretty moderate in this whole thing. He says, there's no rush, we're not going to trigger the Article 50 to leave yet. I think what happened, if you look back in Eastern Europe in 89, a lot of the more moderate politicians who, who, who couldn't foresee a total crumbling of communism were very quickly overtaken by events. And so I think you could see something like this slight, somewhat minor event like a vote could have such huge implications for the future. Now, Gorbachev was in charge of the Soviet system. He more or less allowed it. He didn't fight it. He didn't send in the tanks. 
But uh, and some, of course, the real hawks in in Russia was very disturbed because he should have, you know, cracked down on them and all. But uh, but I think the die was cast. The time had come. Yeah. It was a failed system, and uh, I and I use that same analogy for the system that we have. Uh, the interventionist system, the Keynesian type economics, the fiat money system, the, uh, the, the controls that have been placed on the people. But as long as there's big business special interests still making big bucks and other people at the other end of the spectrum getting their welfare checks mm -hmm. and different things, it, it works for a while. When it ends is when, uh, when the debt is uncontrollable. Now, nobody has to pay interest anymore. You can borrow money uh, and buy stocks, and, uh, but it comes to an end. And I think that's what we're seeing here when the stock market was is down, down sharply. And I think it's going to be down uh, for a long time. But, you know, I don't think this, just, this is a consequence of the inevitability of this whole system falling apart. And I've dated this, this is my personal opinion, from the year 2000 with the NASDAQ bubble. And, uh, and, and that was a big deal. And I don't think we've had real economic growth since then. We've had very meager growth since the Bretton Woods broke down and got rid of the, the, uh, the gold standard. But back in the 90s, the saying was, invest in anything and hold on. You know, and the brokers were making a ton of money and the stocks kept going up. But if, if, you, if anybody had been talked into buying the NASDAQ in the year 2000, it was around 5,000. What's down more than 10% right now. It's down 10% nominally. So if you take into inflation, so if you bought in, seven, in the year 2000, 16 years later, uh, your nest egg would be very much smaller. And huh. today, even smaller than that, uh, all the stock people are losing a lot of money. Some even some rich people are losing money. When when the one percent who have been ripping us off <laughs> and, and, li and living on that free interest rate and making all that money uh, uh, with uh, the military industrial complex, I don't mind it if they lose money. But <laughs> unfortunately, the masses of middle class people who made a little bit of effort to take care of themselves and and, uh, and, and assume responsibility, they are going to suffer. So this, this is going to be a mess, I think, uh, before it's all over. But the only thing I believe that can help this out is, is to present an alternative. What, what do we, well, that's fine, Ron, you describe the problem, but you never tell us what we do. So <laughs> they say, yeah, what are we going to do? Well, uh, my, my slogan is try liberty for a change, <laughs> you know. That might be a lot better than depending on government and printing press money. That hasn't worked and won't work. Yeah, I was going to ask you, you know, if, the first thing you would see is blaming all of the problems now on this vote. And you mentioned a little bit about the financial problems. The, the, the markets, at least when we checked before we started the show, the markets are down. You look anywhere, it's, oh, it's because of the vote. It's because of the vote, the markets are down. As if all of a sudden this, this thing happened. I was going to ask what you thought about that. <laughs> well, it, it's, it's understandable, especially if the system is friable. It's sort of look, looking at a house whose foundation was shaky. It was never built right. And they kept building this house higher and higher. And then a storm comes along. And uh, instead of having a sturdy house that would withstand a storm, you have a fragile house and a, and a small storm comes along and blows it down. Well, uh, what, they're, what they're saying, well, it's all because there was a wind. It was all because there was rough sailing. There had to be a turn. The whole thing crashes. Well, the, the crash comes because uh, of the instability, the malinvestment, the too much debt. Uh, I, I think if you had one thing that you could hone in on to symbolize the, the fragility of the whole system uh, would be debt. Uh, debt, uh, according to the Keynesians, is good because that's how you print money. Debt backs up your currency. You have more treasury bills, you can print more paper money, and that's going to solve all the <laughs> problem. But debt ultimately has to be paid off. And even though it doesn't get paid off directly, governments never earn money and pay debt off, they pay it off uh, with more, more bad money. You know, they default on the currency. So that is there, but the, the fact that the market went down under these conditions merely means that it was supposed to go down and would have gone down. It's not a mild fluctuation of the stock market. Uh, it was significant and will be significant, 
but uh, this is where the money's been going. You know, uh, they print all this money and they make give it to their friends in the financial industries and they have buyback agreements and, and their stocks go up and they make more uh, profits and the, the uh, companies uh, coming together and finance these mergers. Uh, so, but, but it's not a business decision. So that's why everything is fragile. And when you get into these systems in foreign policy, yeah. you know, whether it's, it's NATO <clears throat> or whatever, uh, NATO doing these exercises, <laughs> the great brilliance of having exercises on Russia's border. Yeah, we would really like to have the Russians doing exercises on, on the uh, Mexico uh, border. <laughs> so uh, it's, uh, uh, it, it makes no sense whatsoever as far as I'm concerned. And this is one, one realm we haven't really discussed yet on the show, and that is the, the implications for NATO uh, and also the neocon reaction, because the neocons, I think, are split on the whole Brexit thing. On one hand, those who want a very close relation with the U.S., our special relations between the U.S. and the U.K., uh, they may be for that because they may feel that tightens it. The U.K. is the strongest military in Europe. They spend 2% of their GDP on the military, about half of what we spend, but it's still a heck of a lot more than the rest of Europe does. Uh, but on the other hand, there's a lot of fear among the military industrial types and the neocons that with the UK out of the EU militarily, there'll be less, uh, for example, uh, strength on Russia sanctions. The UK has been closest to the US in pushing for sanctions. Uh, the rest of the EU countries are the ones that have suffered what having trade cut off from a normal trading partner, so there's fear that that might happen. Uh, there is fear among the military co industrial complex that the UK might, might start spending a little bit less on its defense, which I was reading a piece in uh, foreign policy just a little while ago, and, and here's the strange assumption that spending less on military, having less military, somehow lets, makes you less secure, and of course we would argue the opposite. Well, but. But their statistics that they use to show economic strength is if you buy, if you build more uh, F-35s, yeah. that it's all part of the GDP, yeah. <laughs> a worthless airplane, oh, $1.3 trillion. Wow, it's good for the GDP, it's good for the politicians, it's good for the military industrial complex. But uh, it's, uh, it's, it's the whole thing of, of uh, what, what, what real growth is, what real wealth is. And uh, we're doing exactly the opposite, to destroy the wealth. And Mises predicted that doing this will wipe out the middle class, and that is what it does. Anybody that has a little common sense and self-respect and sense of responsibility, they would work hard and save their money yeah. so that they can take care of themselves and not expect this government to take care of them with uh, more fiat money. And everything they've done is to destroy that, destroy the purchasing power of their money and also take away all their interests that they can earn and, and then the people get upset. The problem, though, is, is what are they going to ask for? Are they going to ask for super nationalism and, uh, and populism and another form of government that might even be more seductive? So a lot of the debate that's going on now is competition on what the form of big government is rather than arguing what we need is somebody to defend the liberties of the individual and protect their interests, not their life and their property and the fruits of their labor and get out of their lives and out of their wallets, uh, that would go a long way. And if we did the right thing, there's no sacrifice to the people. They say, oh, you have to sacrifice a lot to get out of this trouble. No, if I got my freedom back, I, I don't think I'd be sacrificing mm -hmm. anything. If everybody got to keep what they earned and had the incentive to do it and that the government wasn't going to come and spy on them be, and, and call them, oh, boy, you said something. You might be related to a terrorist and <laughs> all this nonsense that goes on. People, people would go back to work. But right now we have a long way to go because too many people have become so dependent you know, on government and think government's purpose is to take care of us and make us safe and secure under all conditions. <laughs> Well, I think whatever the case, this is a real seismic shift. I like what you said in your column this week. We should start exiting some things ourselves. <laughs> yeah, there you go. There's a lot of things. I put a little list in there. Mm -hmm. uh, but um, uh, we, we could expand on that list, too, and all the things that we should leave. Because, you know, if, if you have your liberty, uh, you don't have all these programs. You don't have intervention. You don't have a big government. You don't have a lot of taxes. The regulations are dealt with in the marketplace. You're not allowed to lie, steal, cheat, hurt people. Those are pretty strict rules. But, no, 
know, we get the government, they get involved in lying and cheating and stealing. And uh, that's where the, the problem comes and get us involved illegally and based on lies, on wars that we shouldn't be involved in. So, no, I think if we had uh, a concentration on personal liberty, it would be such a blessing and there would be so much prosperity, we could be talking about peace and prosperity a lot more and enjoying it. I want to thank everybody for tuning in today to the Liberty Report. Please come back soon.